My wife broke her marriage vows and shattered my trust completely. What's most unsettling is her attempt to conceal her infidelity and continue our life together as if nothing had happened. However, her plan failed. Is adultery punishable by death? Logically, I know it isn't, but in the heat of the moment, when I caught her and her lover entering that hotel room, having my gun with me could have seemed like a justifiable reaction. Thankfully, by the time I reached my truck, I regained my composure, sparing only a glance at the .357 Magnum I keep in the center console for handling large amounts of cash at work. Though I've only used it at the shooting range, I believe in my right to bear arms. After recounting the incident to my boss, I decided to take the rest of the day off, possibly tomorrow too. I needed to consult a lawyer and make a plan. I withdrew $3,000 from our joint account and opened a new one in my name, leaving enough for rent and bills this month. Canceling our sole emergency credit card was my next move. With a month-to-month -month lease and no children, the process should be straightforward. I can't bring myself to forgive her, especially after discovering this wasn't the first time, it seems to have happened four or five times before. I pieced this together by examining our online account and noticing her discreet transactions to cover hotel charges. If not for my debit card glitch yesterday, I might not have checked our balance. And without that, I wouldn't have seen the credit card payment, leading me to review the charges and uncover today's hotel reservation. Without these steps, I might not have discovered her infidelity, leading to our inevitable divorce. I realize I should have confronted her last night, but I was still processing the shock of her potential betrayal. Now, armed with evidence, it's time to take action. I searched online and found a divorce lawyer who seemed promising. Given our short marriage of four years, I might be able to minimize spousal support despite her recent job with a good salary. We were still living month to month, saving for a house, or so I thought. It's hard to decipher what she truly wanted anymore. Once I finished with all of that, I headed home and grabbed a beer. That's when it hit me, I actually love that person. Why would they betray me like this? What did I do wrong? I knew if I just sat there, I'd drown in self-pity. So, I grabbed some tape and started marking things in the house I wanted to keep, mainly my gaming consoles, the TV, and the workout gear. Everything else was linked to memories with them, too painful to bear. As I roamed, I began concocting revenge fantasies. But when I found myself imagining trapping them in a remote cabin with no supplies or breaking their legs in the wilderness for scavengers, I realized I was going too far. Especially when I pictured giving them a gun with a single dud bullet, so when they tried to end it, they'd hear just a click. Yeah, my thoughts went dark. Then I realized life isn't a fairy tale, so it was best to divorce and move on. I felt a deep sadness when I realized that Gwen, with whom I dreamed of growing old and raising children, would not be that person. Memories flooded back to me a marriage proposal at the theater where we had our first blind date, a three-day weekend in Myrtle Beach, comforting her when her father was fighting cancer, conversations about my moving to another job, our wedding night. Now those memories have been overshadowed by the image of her laughing and holding hands with someone else. My thoughts were interrupted by the sound of the door opening. Julian, why are you back so early? She inquired, rushing towards me for a hug. I stepped back, putting the sofa between us, and simply gazed at her. There were no overt signs that she had been with someone else today, but it didn't come as a shock. Let's not play games, Gwen. I know you've been seeing someone from work, so I suggest you start deciding what you want. Divorce papers will be served on Wednesday, I stated flatly. Her reaction caught me off guard. She almost appeared relieved. I'm truly sorry, Julian. I shouldn't have betrayed your trust. You deserved honesty, she murmured. Are you sorry for cheating or sorry you got caught? I retorted bitterly, I'm sorry for not communicating my unhappiness. I regret not asking for a divorce months ago when I realized I wanted out. 
You deserved better from me, she confessed, tears welling in her eyes. You've been seeing him for months. I couldn't contain the rise in my voice, anger and hurt consumed me. No, we've only been together a handful of times in the past couple of weeks, she sighed. But I've been wanting out of the marriage for the past six months. What? Why? I demanded, feeling like my world had been tilted off its axis. Because I'm 25 years old, and I don't want curfews imposed on me, especially when I'm out enjoying time with friends. I refuse to be constrained by concerns about alcohol consumption potentially affecting your professional relationships at events like Christmas parties. If I see something I desire, like a pair of shoes, I want the freedom to purchase them without feeling guilty about dipping into our future children's college fund, she retorted, her tone heated. So, you've decided you want to revert to your carefree early twenties, shirking adult responsibilities. Fine, you've got it. I've taken half of our savings, I'm removing my name from the lease tomorrow, and I've used some money for an STD test. We were intimate last Sunday, and I suspect you were with him before that. Clearly, I can't trust you to prioritize my health by ensuring protection. If you want freedom, it's all yours. Enjoy your new life with your friends and job, I said, struggling to contain my anger. Yes, Jules. When we got married, I was barely legal drinking age. There's a lot of life experiences we missed out on back then. I thought I was fine with it, but now I'm not so sure. Hanging out with Jeremy and his friends reminded me of the carefree times we used to have, she defended. What does cheating have to do with wanting to experience life? How does seeking excitement justify infidelity within a marriage? I thought, at the very least, we were friends who wouldn't betray each other like this. You're truly disappointing. I used to think it was just my mom and sister, but now I see it's apparently all women who are unfaithful, I had to stop yelling. Gwen winced slightly when I mentioned my mother and sister. My father left because of my mother's infidelity. Seeking solace in alcohol, two years later he was gone. Instead of grieving, my mother became angry about the termination of child support payments. What little my father had left went to my sister and me, and my mother spent the money on cosmetic surgery. She encouraged my sister, Adrian, to have relationships with rich men, even forced her to take birth control pills. Adrian became pregnant at the age of 18 by Tony Winger, the son of a wealthy businessman. When Tony found out he was not the father of the child, he broke off the relationship. Adrian tried to terminate the pregnancy, but due to complications, she also died. My mother tried to sue the doctor, but the legal fees stopped her. The next year was tumultuous as I was striving for good grades despite the chaos at home. A month after I entered college, two local police officers visited me. They took me out of class and informed me about the tragic death of my mother in a car accident. It turned out she was having an affair with her boss, and when they came face to face with his furious wife, they fled in his car and collided with a garbage truck due to his poor health from alcohol. I managed to get a refund from the college for the semester, as I had to withdraw from participation in order to settle the situation. Despite the chaos, our house was completely ours. Surprisingly, my mom had a 401k wallet with almost $100,000 in it, as well as a savings account with $4,300. I also found a stock of DVDs in cash. The DVDs were labeled for seniors, and although I hesitated, I watched one of them where there was a hidden recording of my mom with another man. The amount was almost $9,000, which didn't shock me given the circumstances. I spent a whole month sorting through the paperwork and putting things in order. Some friends came by to express their condolences, although I suspected that some of them were men from the videos. In the end I sold the house, put aside the cash, and resumed the winter semester. I lived modestly, focusing solely on my studies. From time to time, I had casual relationships with girls, but I did not find much satisfaction in them, believing that they caused more problems than they were worth. 
I graduated in the top 25% of my class and secured a managerial position at an up-and-coming construction firm. One evening, I went out to a bar with some friends, which unexpectedly led to meeting several women. My outlook had softened, entertaining the idea that there might be a good woman out there. I thought I hit the jackpot when I met Gwen on a blind date. Despite being a few years older, she seemed great, she was freshly graduated in accounting and had landed a respectable job in forensics with the state police. I believed I had it all. However, it turned out that not all women were trustworthy. As Gwen began to tear up, I grew furious. She wanted out of our marriage, betrayed me by being with someone else, and yet she was the one feeling remorse? Absolutely not. I felt something inside me snap. Suddenly, I felt indifferent. You will receive divorce papers on Wednesday at noon at your workplace. I've indicated the belongings I'm taking from the apartment, they'll be gone by tomorrow. You keep your car, and I'll keep mine. My name will be off the lease by the end of the month. After the first of the month, the place is yours alone if you want it. I've taken half the money from the account. I expect the credit card to be paid off and cancelled. I don't intend for this to turn ugly, mainly because I never want to see your lying, despicable face again. I took a deep breath, needing to calm myself as I felt the urge to repeat my grievances. Tell your young lover to stay away from me. I understand that he just took advantage of an opportunity, so I will not pursue him. However, if our paths cross, I will not hesitate to confront him. Not because you're worth my time, but because a real man doesn't pursue married people. Someone has to teach him a lesson, and if our paths cross, I'll gladly do it. If not me, then maybe the husband of the next married woman he decides to have an affair with. She cringed at my repeated use of the phrase girl of easy virtue. No luck, I said, picking up my bags and brushing past her. I'll pick up the rest of my things tomorrow while you're at work. If you want to challenge this, delete the recording, and I will include it in the divorce process so that the judge can make a decision, I said, leaving. She didn't dispute the divorce at all. When mom died, I transferred all the proceeds from the sale of her house and other assets to a trust fund. My accountant assured me that as long as my money remains in the trust, it will not be taken into account when calculating my net income to help students. She also advised me to invest the money rather than leave it idle. However, it turned out that she was wrong, the money held in trust is indeed a factor in financial assistance, at least in the form in which she distributed mine. A year later, she went bankrupt, another example of incompetence. Since my trust funds were linked to investments, it was easier to take out a few student loans. Fortunately, my company had a program that allocated $5,000 annually to repay student loans. I could have done it. Overall, the outcome of my disastrous relationship with my accountant was actually positive. Despite not being shielded from student aid due to a lack of trust, it did protect me from the divorce because I hadn't designated Gwen as a trustee. There was around $600,000 in there that she couldn't access. I relocated from the apartment and found a small furnished loft near my workplace. I wanted to completely disassociate from her, so I entrusted everything to my lawyer. There were some negotiations regarding my 401k, and to simplify matters, I ended up giving her a check for $115,000 and walked away. The reason she didn't seek any support became clear, after everything settled down, she had gotten pregnant and was planning a summer wedding. I suppose all her complaints about not wanting commitment were just nonsense. Over the following year, I fully dedicated myself to my job and was eventually promoted to a new role. I became the Improvement Assessment Coordinator for the entire company. With our acquisition of several smaller companies, my task was to enhance their efficiency, traveling across the country. I worked to align these newly acquired companies with our standards. I earned the nickname Hatchet Man because my first priority was to trim the excess. 
many of these companies had long-term employees who were not meeting expectations after 10 or 15 years of tenure. I provided them with an opportunity to improve, but if they failed to do so, they were let go. Generally, those with less than 10 years of service were more receptive to change in order to retain their jobs. While I didn't intentionally target senior employees, I gained a reputation for cutting senior staff. Despite being viewed unfavorably by both management and hourly employees, I remained indifferent. My objective was to drive profits for the company, not to make friends. After all, bills weren't going to be paid with mere optimism. As for my personal life, in the first year after the divorce, I became disillusioned with women. I hadn't met any worthwhile women, so why waste time inviting them to dinner? In the second year, I felt the need for casual intimacy. Having a lot of money and traveling often, I decided to support the oldest profession in the world. There's a saying, isn't there? Ladies are not paid for intimacy, but for her to leave. It summed up my life perfectly. I'd come to town, mind my own business, and either hire a top-notch call girl. Meetings were usually satisfying, and we both understood what was going on. I should have done this from the very beginning, the relationship was not for me. I had no idea what my ex-wife was doing, and to be honest, I didn't care. Someone might expect me to say that I sought counseling to solve my problems with Gwen and women in general, but no, I didn't do that. Although consultations can be useful for those who need them, I had no desire to change. I enjoyed a variety of noncommittal meetings, took most of my earnings, and indulged in my passion for restoring old motorcycles. I had moved an hour away long ago and purchased a spec house on the outskirts of a small town. The property included a large pole building within which sat an old 1969 Triumph Bonneville. Though I had requested the garage to be cleared out before the sale was finalized, it seemed the previous owner had neglected to do so. As per the terms of the purchase agreement, I legally acquired everything inside the pole building upon taking possession. While the motorcycle was in a state of partial disassembly, its classic design captured my heart. Being adept with my hands, I invested in a quality set of Mac tools and began restoration work. By the time the previous owner attempted to reclaim the bike, I had already made significant progress, and after some debate, it was clear that their failure to retrieve it relinquished their claim, making it mine. To avoid legal proceedings, I offered them $500 in exchange for signing the title over to me, which they accepted. This marked the beginning of my passion for restoring vintage motorcycles. Another project soon followed when I came across a 1963 BSA Gold Star Spitfire in need of attention. Despite not being a professional, my skills steadily improved. Instead of selling completed projects to fund new ones as planned, I found myself accumulating a fine collection of restored classics. So there I was, seven years post-divorce with a healthy bank balance, excelling in my job, enjoying a fulfilling hobby, and having access to all the company I could afford. I was feeling pretty content. That is, until I returned home with a new throttle cable for my recent purchase, only to find an old, battered Toyota sedan parked in my driveway. As I maneuvered around it, I spotted a woman stepping out of the car. Stepping out, I found myself face to face with my ex-girl, J.W. If there were any way to avoid this encounter, I would have taken it. I know I've wronged you, and though I regret it deeply, I can't undo the past as much as I wish I could. But this isn't about me, it's about our daughter, she rushed to explain, handing me a photo of a sweet little girl with a wide grin, a few baby teeth missing. It seemed to be taken at a mall or someplace similar. She's adorable. It's a pity her mother is such a promiscuous woman. So what's your game, claiming she's mine, given your extracurricular activities towards the end of our marriage? She could be anyone's. I heard the Fifth Fleet was in town around that time. I retorted, she let out a sigh. Julian, feel free to criticize me all you want. I messed up big time. 
I was a terrible person and I deserve any harsh words you have for me. But our daughter has leukemia and urgently needs a bone marrow donor. I'm not exaggerating when I say her life depends on it. We've exhausted all other options. She's on a donor list but it could take years, and she only has months. I know she's yours because Jeremy is sterile and you're the only other person I've been with. You can hate me, most of the time I hate myself. If you want to confront me and take out your anger, go ahead. But please, please, please get tested to see if you're a match. She was in tears at this point, but I remained unmoved. So you're suggesting I undergo a rather invasive procedure to assist a daughter who may or may not be mine, raised by another man? A man who has been there for her first steps, her first words, her first lost tooth, moments I missed because of your confusion about whose partner was where. Have you disclosed my existence to her? Would she even recognize me in a lineup? Even if I were the biological donor, I can't rightfully claim the title of father that belongs to the man who raised her. By the way, where's the little cuck old? It seems you two fell in love quickly after betraying me, I responded, noticing her saddened expression. Jeremy left us when he discovered he wasn't her biological father. His parents pressured him into a test, which showed no genetic connection. It turns out he's infertile, possibly always has been. I don't miss him, but it pains me that he left Laura alone in a hospital bed, never to return. He's the only father she's known, and his abandonment hurt her deeply. So, in a way, there's some sort of retribution for you. I'm a single mother now, struggling on welfare to care for a chronically ill child, she explained. Listen, she continued through tears, my life has been a nightmare for the past two years. Trust me when I say any revenge you desire has already been served. Laura is the only good thing to come out of our breakup. If you want to know more, you'll have to undergo testing. She handed me contact information along with a few pictures of Laura. Please, JW, get tested, she pleaded as she hurried back to her car. Her departure was delayed due to difficulty starting the engine, requiring three attempts. Upon pulling out, I noticed oil drops on my driveway. While fetching cat litter to clean it, I pondered her request, though I may be considered selfish. I couldn't bear the thought of a child potentially suffering harm, even if she wasn't biologically mine. No seven-year-old should face such a predicament. Surprisingly, I swiftly decided to undergo testing and made the necessary arrangements. As it turned out, Laura was indeed my biological daughter. Furthermore, the test revealed a close enough match for the bone marrow procedure. Without informing Gwen, I arranged everything. I also had a private investigator conduct a background check on Gwen, myself, and my parents. To my surprise, her story checked out. She had struggled financially for the past two years, relying on assistance and waitressing while spending much time in hospitals. The medical bills, even with Medicaid, had burdened her greatly. All in all, their situation seemed bleak. I made the decision to sell my bike collection in order to free up the funds necessary for medical bills and child support. Interestingly, I had turned down all previous offers to sell my bikes, but upon learning I had a daughter, the choice became clear. I surprised the HR manager by requesting four weeks off and adding my daughter to my insurance policy. Although she seemed curious for the whole story, I remained reserved, knowing she was prone to gossip. Quietly, I arrived at the hospital with paperwork for Gwen to sign in one hand and the largest teddy bear I could find in the other. My heart nearly shattered when I saw the small figure with no hair and numerous tubes connected to her body. I struggled to hold back tears as she opened her eyes and smiled at me. In that moment, I felt my entire world shift. I was determined to shield this little girl from any harm or danger. Ignoring Gwen's attempt to embrace me, I approached the hospital bed. Hey, was the only thing. I took a moment to reflect on why I couldn't bring myself to do so. 
it boiled down to the realization that I would have to interact with her regularly in the future, coupled with the understanding that she was already struggling. Apart from her relationship with her daughter, she seemed to have very little else. She had made her choices and was living with the consequences. Strange as it may seem, my sense of justice felt satisfied. While I still harbored distrust and didn't particularly like her, I resolved not to hold on to hatred. I'm not going to lash out at you, I said, interrupting my own thoughts. She flinched slightly, giving me a puzzled look. When you first approached me, you offered to let me vent my frustrations on you. I won't do that. In fact, I'm going to make a concerted effort to let go of any animosity and anger towards you. Our daughter is important, and I refuse to subject her to the same toxic environment I experienced growing up. I'd rather release my resentment and ensure that our daughter grows up in a loving and stable home, I elaborated. Some of the tension seemed to dissipate from her demeanor. I realize you wouldn't physically harm me, Julian, even though I believe I deserve it. I simply want to express. Stop, I interjected, perhaps too forcefully. I don't want to hear your apology. There's nothing you can say to justify what you did and how you did it. The fundamental truth is, you didn't want to be married to me and you wanted to engage in extramarital affairs. You could have been honest about wanting a divorce, but instead, you chose to betray me and carry on with your infidelity, pretending as if everything was fine. It wasn't an accident, it was a deliberate choice. You're not the victim here, and I won't sympathize with how your life has unfolded. If it weren't for our daughter, I would never want to see you again. But because we have a child together, I'm committed to ensuring she has the best life possible. That means having both a mother and a father. So, let's eat and discuss how we can improve our daughter's life. She glanced at her burger, then back at me. For the next 20 minutes, we had a constructive conversation about Laura and how we could support her through her illness. Surprisingly, it was a relatively pleasant exchange. The neighborhood they resided in was extremely rough. I was aware they lived in government-subsidized housing, but I didn't grasp the severity of the situation in that area. After parking my truck, I let Gwen go to retrieve the items near the entrance of her apartment building. Three men were loitering with their pants down around their knees. I remained near my truck, cautious of the neighborhood. Gwen was inside for approximately fifteen minutes before emerging and passing by the group of men. Their leering stares provoked my protective instincts, and I stepped out of my truck as they began to surround her. Hey, Chica, you're too pretty to be living alone around here. You need a man to take care of you, don't you? The fool taunted as he invaded her personal space. My heart raced as I retrieved my Glock 19 from its holster. While many argue that a .40 cal is a superior cartridge, I prefer the affordability of 9mm rounds due to my frequent shooting practice, I thought. Until a few moments ago, I never expected to find myself in a gunfight. However, now I wasn't so certain. She already has someone looking out for her, so why don't you step aside until I deal with all of you? My voice may have faltered a little, but I was still aiming at the instigator. The girl turned around as Gwen rushed to the truck. He hesitated to put his hand in his belt but changed his mind when he realized that I was holding him at gunpoint. I noticed the fear in the eyes of the two behind him, but their leader just looked at me with a cold stare. If you grab a gun, I'll pull the trigger. They'll just see it as a scared white guy protecting his friend from immigrants who are taking away our jobs. So, let's calm down. Let me and my wife get in the truck and drive away, then you can go back to your business, I said, stepping back but still aiming at the leader. I managed to climb back into the truck and sit down, still holding her at gunpoint. I turned the ignition key, put it in gear, and turned away only when I accelerated. I heard three loud bangs before turning the corner and speeding away. The next two times, I ran a red light and got on the highway as fast as possible. After about 15 minutes, I slowed down to make sure no one was following us. 
My heart was pounding, and Gwen was sobbing in the passenger seat next to me. I'm not taking my daughter back to this terrible place, I growled. What do you have in this apartment that you need to pick up? Just our clothes, some dishes, and stuff, she replied, coming to her senses. A lot of our stuff is still in the warehouse, but I'm probably going to lose it soon. I'll buy you new clothes and get her new toys, I offered. We'll empty your storage unit, and you'll move into my place for now. I have a four-bedroom house with two bathrooms. You'll take one, Laura will take the other. You'll handle cooking and cleaning until you find a job. No boyfriends allowed at the house, and I won't bring any girlfriends. I'm away about once a month for work. My house won't be your hookup spot. Be serious about this. If I find out you're bringing guys over, I'll kick you out and go for full custody of Laura. She glanced at me, then at the floor. I'm not seeing anyone, Juice. I haven't had the time or desire for the past three years, and I don't see that changing any time soon. So, don't worry about that. And thank you. I know you don't exactly want me around, but it'll be nice to have a safe place, she said quietly. You should thank Carlos, I replied. Carlos and I were inseparable as kids despite our contrasting backgrounds. While I came from humble origins considered white trash by many, Carlos was a wealthy Hispanic boy raised by elderly white adoptive parents. Our bond remained strong until illness struck Carlos at 16. I made regular visits to the hospital, witnessing his gradual decline as cancer ravaged his body. Tragically, he passed away just before turning 18. Three years later, his adoptive parents also passed away. Every day, I couldn't help but envy the unwavering love and support Carlos received from his parents. I yearned to provide the same for my daughter, even if it meant enduring a difficult marriage. It was too late for me to lead a conventional life, but if I could give my daughter the warmth and security Carlos had, I was willing to make sacrifices. We retrieved her belongings from storage and had her settled into the spare bedroom within the next couple of days. I may have gone a bit overboard with decorating Laura's room, but she was my only daughter. Over the next few days, I prepared myself for the procedure. I'm not fond of hospitals, and I suspect the nurses assigned to me were deliberately using the dullest needles they could find, but I made it through. In total, it took a week. Little Laura showed improvement for a month, but then it was discovered that the treatment hadn't been successful. So, I was out for another week as they attempted it once more. Again, it was unsuccessful, although there was enough positive response for the doctors to consider a third attempt. Finally, it was successful. For months after the last treatment, I welcomed Laura to her new home. This is where I recount the narrative of how Gwen and I rekindled our love. Nope, didn't happen. It might sound strange, but I perceived Gwen as two distinct individuals. There was the mother Gwen who could be warm, loving, supportive, and patient. That was the Gwen who took care not only of Laura but also of me. Laura had missed so much time from school that we decided to homeschool her for a while to catch her up. Gwen excelled at all of that, simultaneously teaching Laura and maintaining a clean house with dinner ready. Then there was Gwen, the wife. I could never forget how deeply she hurt me. Gwen, the wife, was the one who betrayed my trust and kept the fact that I had a daughter from me. Every time I started to think that maybe Gwen was all right, the anger would resurface. I felt awful because Gwen seemed genuinely remorseful about how things turned out but I wasn't receptive to any hints of an apology. After exhausting all my sick leave, I returned to work. My first day back was incredibly difficult as I missed my daughter terribly, walking out the door. I felt a surge of anger and jealousy towards Gwen for being able to spend time with our daughter while I had to go to work. This anger fueled me, particularly when it came to slashing expenses on my next project. While the boss would have been satisfied with a 7% to 12% reduction, I managed to achieve a projected 16% cut by reducing employee benefits and laying off some of the more senior staff. 
I didn't discriminate between hourly workers and managers. I trimmed excess at all levels, resulting in three managers being let go. It was evident that the plant manager was relieved to see me leave. I couldn't catch a flight out of town until the next day, so I checked into the modest airport hotel where I usually stayed and spent the evening at the bar downstairs. I never opted for luxury accommodations when traveling, especially considering the optics of cutting costs and letting people go. Staying at a lavish hotel would only exacerbate the situation. While sipping on my expensive, diluted scotch, I noticed an attractive brunette entering the room. It was a familiar scenario, she had likely been unsuccessful at a few upscale clubs uptown and was now trying her luck down here. Fortunately, I was feeling amorous and had enough cash to afford her services for the night. We engaged in casual conversation, skirting around the topic of payment. After entrusting my wallet and valuables to the front desk clerk, I escorted her to my room. Despite the presence of a safe, I couldn't shake the thought that she might be armed and capable of coercing me into opening it. She seemed professional, having texted someone her whereabouts and time frame, whether a friend or a pimp. Once inside, I placed $400 on the nightstand, eliciting a puzzled look from her considering our earlier discussions had revolved around $300. It's been almost six months, so I was hoping you'd be willing to spend a bit more time conversing with me tonight, I remarked with a smirk. In response, she threw me onto the bed. She was skilled in bed, she didn't say much, but she knew how to satisfy. After our session, she headed to the bathroom to take a shower, which seemed like a smart decision considering how sweaty we were. Feeling that I needed to take a shower too, I joined her after drying off. We sat down to chat, and I poured us a whiskey. I shared a condensed version of my story, and she nodded, making appropriate remarks. Soon, she dressed quickly, checked her appearance, took the money, and said goodbye to me. I fell fast asleep. The next morning, squeezed into my cramped seat on the coach, my mind wandered back to the previous night's encounter. It was enjoyable, unquestionably so. I've been with many paid companions, and she definitely ranked among the best. Yet, something felt amiss. I resolved not to dwell on it too deeply, shifting my focus to what I could get Laura, my daughter, who had adapted admirably and would be starting second grade come fall. I ensured Gwen had sufficient funds to purchase any clothes or toys she might need. Was she too young for one of those new tablets with drawing capabilities? And what about a cell phone at nine years old? Did she really need one? I pondered, reaching out to some acquaintances for advice, though truthfully, I lacked close friends. Perhaps my assistant, who had children, could offer insight. At the airport gift shop, I selected a stuffed frog for my daughter. I was thoroughly enjoying this newfound role as a father. When I walked through the door, the enticing aroma of dinner greeted me, but what truly warmed my heart was the exuberant squeal and tight embrace from my daughter. She sported a new dress adorned with a ribbon in her hair. Mom got me this dress so I could look nice for you when you came home. She also thinks I have enough hair now for a new haircut. Do you like it? Daddy, she inquired. I couldn't contain my emotions, a wave of tenderness washed over me, and tears welled up in my eyes. You look absolutely stunning, sweetheart. That dress suits you beautifully, and your haircut makes you look like a princess, I replied, enfolding her in a warm hug and planting a kiss on her forehead. I have something for you. I added retrieving a bag from the store and unveiling the frog. Inside. The lady at the store said, this little guy needs a name, and I knew you'd have the perfect one for him. Her eyes lit up with delight as she gazed at the frog for a moment. His name is Randy. Hey, Randy, I'm going to introduce you to Charlie the Bear. You two will be great pals, she declared to the toy. She began to make her way to her room but then turned back, throwing her arms around me once more. Thanks, Dad. That young girl was amazing. I glanced at her mother, who also had tears in her eyes. My heart sank as I realized Gwen had kept this from me. 
I could have experienced this for the past eight years. I pushed that thought away. My own mother had been bitter about life, but I refused to let my bitterness towards Gwen taint my relationship with our daughter, so I forced a smile onto my face. Gwen must have sensed my change in mood because she suddenly became very subdued. I plastered on a fake smile. Dinner smells delicious, I attempted to say in a normal tone. Thanks, Julian. I dug up my old recipes and tried to recreate the chicken parmesan just the way you like it, she responded. This was going to be a treat, her chicken parm was exceptional. I'm sure it will be, I replied with genuine enthusiasm. She was trying her best to maintain a sense of normalcy for Laura's sake. I could do the same. Besides, it was nice to have my clothes taken care of and the house cleaned. My daughter and her mother had been living with me for about three months now. Laura was such a joy, and if putting up with Gwen was the price, I could handle it. I didn't want Gwen to leave because I knew she would take Laura with her. I had considered seeking primary custody of my daughter but my lawyer pointed out that with my work schedule and lack of parenting experience, it would be an uphill battle. Plus, a girl needs her mother. About a year after they relocated and Laura had resumed attending regular school, Gwen had effectively educated her not just in the necessary subjects but also in study skills and focus, resulting in her consistently making the honor roll. Life was going smoothly for me, during my out-of-town trips, I'd occasionally find companionship. My household chores were managed with a clean home and cared for clothes, while dinner was reliably served, and my daughter remained the center of my world. Gwen and I had settled into a contented routine, her gradual emergence from her shell surprised me. When she timidly broached the idea of using the car to seek employment, I had purchased a newer used Subaru wagon for her to transport Laura and handle errands, a reliable vehicle with excellent safety ratings. Gwen, that car is yours as far as I'm concerned. I wouldn't use it if you moved out, and its age means it holds little resale value. Why don't I transfer the title into your name? If anything were to happen to me, everything is set up to go to Laura, it'll be held in trust until she's 18, at which point she can decide what to do. You should have a car to assist her until she's independent, I assured her. I could see her eyes welling up with tears. Julian, thank you so much for everything you've done for us. I'm not entirely sure why you're being so kind. You must know by now that I wouldn't stand in the way of you seeing Laura, even if I could, and the child support wouldn't be much more than what you're already contributing for the two of us here. Why are you treating us so well, or rather, me, she inquired. As I contemplated how to phrase my response, I realized something significant. For the first time, I wasn't harboring any anger towards her. Previously, I had suppressed it, not wanting it to affect Laura, but now there was a genuine absence of animosity. I released a deep breath and gathered my thoughts. My mother poisoned me and my sister with her bitterness and hatred. I didn't want to pass that on to Laura, so I buried it. Make no mistake. If Laura hadn't entered my life, I might have held on to resentment towards you until my dying day. But things are different now. The simple answer to your question is that Laura likes you, so I do too. I believe we can move forward, being friendly if not friends, I explained. Tears began to flow, and she approached me, offering a hug. Strangely, my allergies flared up, and my eyes welled with tears too. Releasing the pent-up anger and hurt felt liberating, though there was still lingering resentment, it no longer consumed me. Laura walked into the kitchen, witnessing our embrace and tears. She joined in, and the three of us held each other tightly for a long while. I felt overwhelming pride as my daughter walked across the stage to receive her diploma. Sitting beside me, Gwen held my hand, her eyes glistening with tears. Laura had been accepted into Harvard, and she couldn't stop talking about it. Although I was thrilled for her, the thought of financing an Ivy League education seemed daunting. Thankfully, she had secured some scholarships, easing the burden on her education fund. I didn't want to crush her dreams, 
but I worried about managing the full tuition. Regarding my ex-wife, six months after our last conversation, she found a job and moved out. We had a heartfelt discussion where she tried to justify her departure. She mentioned feeling disconnected from our circle of friends and family, influenced by new acquaintances, particularly one who took advantage of her vulnerability. She admitted that infidelity led her to realize she preferred being single again. Our marriage, initially driven by fear and external pressures due to her pregnancy, left her fearing my reaction upon discovering the truth about Laura's paternity. Despite suspicions I have yet to confront her about, she remains in denial. As for the troublemaker, sometimes karma delivers an opportunity that's too good to pass up. Our company acquired his business, and guess who they tasked with evaluating productivity? To add to the irony, his father, who had worked at the company for 19 years and helped his son land the job, was also let go along with 10 others. It took them a month to connect the dots, leading to a flurry of threatening calls and emails. Fortunately, my decisions were backed by my track record and performance reviews. They sued our company, but we delayed proceedings until their lawyer grew tired of waiting for payment. The troublemaker's mistreatment of my daughter during his exit and his father's derogatory remarks only added fuel to the fire. Speaking of missteps, I may have made quite a few last night. Gwen, upset over Laura's departure, came by for a talk. We've grown close, supporting each other through thick and thin. She had been dating someone she thought was decent, only to discover he was married. I helped her pack his belongings and return them to his surprised wife. That night, in our shared vulnerability, we found comfort in each other. While it may have been a lapse in judgment born of shared history, inviting her to stay over and spending intimate hours together may have been a mistake. I'm grappling with many uncertainties right now, but today, my thoughts are consumed by Laura. As for tomorrow, well, I suppose we'll figure it out as it comes.